roles and responsibilities of crew members flying on the B-17 Flying Fortress. The B-17 Flying Fortress is a World War II high altitude strategic bomber. Uh, we had 10 cr crew members occupying various stations and performing various functions. So let's use this graphic and start at the nose and take a look at the first crew position. Uh, we're looking at the bombardier and he is hunched over a mechanical analog computer called the Norton Bombsight. The, the Norton Bombsight, if the information's dialed in correctly, will provide a ballistic solution for the ordnance that you're dropping. These guys, these uh, bombs. Typical bomb load on a B-17 is 12, 500 pound bombs. They're cruising at, you know, 100, well, 240 or so uh, miles per hour. That would be the true airspeed at about 30,000 feet. So the bombardier was responsible for operating the Norton bomb site. As a bombardier, you don't drop your bombs directly over the target. You'll drop them about two and a half miles before you go over the target, given the parabolic solution that the ordnance will have. Bombardier had a secondary role, and that is as a gunner. So depending on the model of the B-17, the F model would have a cheek turret that would be here. Didn't have a lot of arc travel and certainly none really facing completely forward. So to rectify that in the next model, the G model, they added a Bendix turret down here, which had uh, more two more forward facing guns and the bombardier would operate the fire control unit for that, that turret. And that would, that would have been on the, the G model. Just uh, behind the bombardier is the navigator. The navigator is responsible for uh, determining the position of the airplane and providing information to the pilot on correct heading to get to target and to come back home. Now, in this orientation, we see that he's sitting at a table, you know, facing the viewer. And in real life, he would have been facing the other way. The table's actually on the left side of the airplane. On the right side of the airplane, there's instruments here. There's a compass and a, a, a drift meter. So uh, the navigator also was a uh, dual role as a gunner. He had a machine gun. It would have been on the left side. And, you know, just a little few words on, on, on uh, defensive armament. The B-17s were armed with, uh, you know, wartime B-17s, the uh, F and G models were armed with 11 to 13 machine guns. They're all Browning M2 50 caliber machine guns. And they, uh, with a crew of 10, there were eight gun stations on this airplane. So when they were under attack, everybody manned a, a what they call flexible mount uh, turret or, a, uh, or the uh, power turrets like the ball turret gunner or the upper turret. So if we move farther aft, we have the uh, pilot who sits on the left side and the co-pilot who sits on the right side. The pilot's also the um, commander of the airplane. So if we move farther aft, we see uh, a crew member standing up in this plexiglass dome, and that is the flight engineer. The flight engineer is responsible for uh, engine maintenance in flight if needed. He's also responsible for uh, transferring fuel and helping the pilot co-pilot with their uh, with their instrumentation. Um, these four crew members are the officers of the crew. They're generally first or second lieutenant, two, second lieutenants. The other crew members, including the flight engineer uh, back up here, they are uh, enlisted personnel. So they would be uh, they would be staff sergeants. Aft crew compartment, we have uh, the radio room operator, that's the radio shack. And the radio room operator is responsible for communications. Uh, he has a um, Morse code set and he has a voice set. So he can use either one of those to communicate to other airplanes. They typically re uh, remain radio silent. Now getting from this compartment to this forward compartment, uh, that can be done uh, between the bomb racks. There's actually a small, narrow catwalk. They call it catwalk. It's about eight inches wide platform that you would walk along to get from here to here. Just one issue about leaving your crew station. Uh, all these crew members are tethered to their station by, by three systems. So uh, we have a oxygen mask. We have a, you can see the headset and he'd have a throat mic. 
um, and they also have heated suits. So you have an electrical wire coming out of your suit and you would uh, plug into a rheostat. So if you wanted to get to this section of the airplane, you'd have to untether your oxygen comps and um, heated suit. Now, the problem with that is at 30,000 feet, um, you're susceptible to anoxia and uh, oxygen deprivation. So uh, you would become unconscious in about a minute and you would die in 20 minutes. So they had these little walk around bottles about the size of a pineapple that had about eight minutes worth of oxygen. So you would uh, unclip your oxygen line from the airplane and then clip it in or, you know, plug it into one of these little uh, walk around bottles and then clip the walk around bottle to either your parachute harness or your flak jacket and then you could walk around for eight minutes if you needed to. Just after the radio room operator is the ball turret gunner and let's take a look at his expanded view. So he is in the fetal position. Now this view is a little incorrect because the machine guns are actually on the outside of his legs and the machine guns provide some degree of protection because they're, they're thick plated steel. He also has some armor. The thickest armor on the airplane, by the way, is, is this uh, seat pad. It's about 0.6 inches thick uh, ballistic armor. And then his seat back is actually armored also about a quarter inch thick. This is hinged, by the way. So this, this is like a panel that you can, um, you, know, you can bring down and that's how he gets in and out of the ball turret gunner. He has a gun sight. It's a different optical gun sight from the other stations. Two ammo boxes, roughly 500 rounds each. Uh, and he could rotate this ball around in uh, 360 degrees in eight seconds. So on takeoff and landing, he would not be in this ball. He would be, uh, they'd, all the crew members would be in the, the radio room, which is a structurally sound location. Then when they got airborne, uh, they would crank this ball. When I say crank, you, you wanna rotate it. You want these barrels to go straight down, which means this hatch would be rotating in, uh, you know, in the upper exposed area of the fuselage. Then you open up the hatch, crew member gets in, puts his feet up on stirrups, his left foot works the, uh, the gun sight, uh, his right foot, he's, where his, uh, the ball of his feet are, uh, works the, uh, his throat mic if he needs to have any communications. Crew members generally small of stature, uh, crew member, and they were pretty well protected. Um, you look at the stats, you can see that the ball turret gunner actually had um, less casualties than the other crew members. Now, if you have to bail out, that's another story because now you have to get back inside the airplane because these guys did uh, generally did not wear their parachute given the cramped confinements nor, uh, nor flak suit. So, um, but you're well protected by armor. Um, if you bailed out, you'd have to get some assistance from the waste gunners or radio room operator, you know, crank those barrels straight down, get in, clip on your parachute, you know, get rid of your, um, you know, oxygen system while you're in here and then get to the bailout door, which is right about here. Just after the ball turret gunner is the waste gunners. Um, notice in this orientation, they're back to back. So that tells me that this is the F model. Um, they bumped into each other quite a bit while they're scanning and or uh, operating their, their Browning machine guns. So on the next version, they took this window on the right side and they, they shifted it forward. So it would have been over here. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't necessarily be back to back. If we go uh, and this kind of his position, although none of these views really show what the crew members wore in flight. Not, you know, they all had oxygen masks. Anytime you're above 10,000 feet, you went on oxygen. And these guys, you know, they bombed anywhere from 24,000 to 30,000 feet. You'd have on goggles, you'd have on an, an M3 helmet, you'd have on a flak jacket. Uh, the parachute was a chest parachute, not this back parachute. There's, there's lots of um, errors in these views, but that's okay. I'll talk about some of these crew positions in more detail. And if we go back to the tail um, and, and his exploded view, he had twin 50 caliber machine guns, got a flow deflector on the end. He's got ammo boxes, about 500 rounds. He's on his knees and he's sitting on a bicycle seat. It's actually made by Schwinn. And there's his, uh, his uh, 35 mil red gun sight, which is mechanically linked, linked to the barrels. Now, this is, uh, this is the only ballistic glass in his location, this little pane right here. The rest of the uh, transparencies are, are either plexiglass or tempered glass. Like we have tempered glass here too, but his transparency, he has no armor. Uh, transparencies. The pilot has armor on his uh, windscreen, by the way. 